Um, so as we mentioned, today's webinar is about predicting real world performance of highest generated applications with core from Qubit and Corbett Velodyne. Great if you want to advance the slide. So again, I'm Matt Cedarberg, the CEO of Coreform. I'll be uh, one of your hosts today. I'm joined with by Ryan Bobrick and Greg Klaus from Corvid. And today we will briefly introduce Coreform Qubit. And then the bulk of the webinar will be introducing uh, Velodyne, including a live demo of how to use Qubit and Velodyne. And then there'll be Q&A at the end. Throughout the webinar, as you have questions, go ahead and you can type them on the chat. It's a little bit easier for us to track them if you type them on the Q&A and we'll answer them as soon as is appropriate. Um, so you can go ahead and advance the slide, Greg. Uh, just a, a little bit of intro about Coreform Qubit. We assume that many of you are aware of Qubit. It's been developed for the last few decades to provide advanced meshing for challenging simulations. It has a strong su suite of CAD import and cleanup tools, very strong hex meshing tools. Uh, Python and scripting is used a lot by your users. One of my favorite things about Qubit though is how it supports dozens of third-party independent solvers. And I, I love getting to know those programs better and understanding how Qubit's used in those workflows, how we can improve those. And that's the focus of today's webinar is how Qubit works with, with Velodyne's, uh, Corbett's Velodyne. So if we uh, go to the next slide, we like to now have a poll uh, that we'll ask to just learn a little bit about who's on the webinar today. So uh, Velodyne is software that's uh, used for explicit dynamics and dynamic and nonlinear and high strain rate problems. We're curious how many of you have actually run those problems in the last year? So if you can indicate that in the poll. And then uh, the second question that we've got is, is which barriers prevent you from doing these types of simulations more often? So is it is an issue with not having capable software, lack of expertise in-house, meshing and pre-processing taking too long, maybe it takes too long to get the model tuned and debugged, the results, you may have questions trusting the results or perhaps the cost of hardware and HPC access. So let's leave this poll open for another few seconds, then we'll, we'll close it and share out the, res the results. Okay, close it up in about three seconds. Okay, so here's, here's who we've, we've got today. So just over half of those in attendance have, have run um, the types of problems that Velodyne is, is often used for. And all sorts of reasons why uh, these simulations may not be run more often. Looks like some of the leading reasons are, have to do with expertise, uh, pre-processing or model tuning. Um, go ahead and advance the slide, Greg. So the, the, um, what, we're, what we're talking about today, the learning objectives is in how Corbin Velodyne and Qubit, Core from Qubit can enable the simulation of explicit and high strain problems. And for the rest of the webinar, we'll be talking about each of those six issues that we raised in the poll as far as barriers that may be preventing you from running these types of simulations today. Introduce how Velodyne and Qubit are suitable for both your easiest and very hardest problems. Uh, the very streamlined workflow that Velodyne has for these problems, especially compared to other commercial products on the market. Uh, the optimal workflow that's been optimized for over the past decade with Qubit that um, Corvid's done in-house with Velodyne, uh, including uh, the customized tools they've created inside of Qubit. We'll touch on how Velodyne's been, uh, the results of Velodyne have been verified, uh, embedded by rigorous U US Department of Defense standards. And then at the end, we'll talk about Corvid HPC, which is a really neat way to get affordable, scalable access to Velodyne. So with that, let me turn the time over and just a, a brief introduction of Ryan Bobrick and Greg Klaus. So Ryan Bobrick is the director of sales at Corvid. He'll give more of his background in just a minute. Greg Klaus is technical lead at Corvid, Corvid Technologies with nine years experience running Velodyne, including meshing with Qubit, post-processing, scripting, testing, and documenting, training, sales, and support. And he's currently helping customers become successful operating engineering codes like Velodyne and Corvid's HPC services. So with that, let me turn the time, turn the time over to Greg and Ryan. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Matt. This is Ryan Bobrick from Corvid. 
Really appreciate everyone joining today. We're really excited to share the Velodyne story today. Even though Velodyne has over 100 current active users and has been utilized to complete thousands of engineering problems, this is one of the first times we're sharing the Velodyne story with a non-DoD audience. What you can expect to learn today is how we're helping our customers accurately predict real-world performance of their designs in the most challenging physics areas using Coreform Qubit and Corvid Velodyne. And before, <clears throat> before I forget this, I see we've got a few international viewers. There's a lot of references to the DoD in our presentation. Um, one of the things I just want to note is we have full clearance to be able to share, uh, to share the presentation to anyone. And also, um, we can fully sell Velodyne or any of our solutions all around the gold globe, as long as you're not in an export um, blocked country, Russia's <laughs> there, China, any of those. So any of our international visitors just want to make sure that this is still potentially for you if you're dealing with high strain rate problems. Next slide, Greg. I'd like to take a second to introduce Corvid. And the best way I know to introduce the company is to share the story of why I'm here and why I was so excited to join the team. For the last 13 years, I've worked with companies developing products using advanced technologies like simulation, 3D printing, 3D scanning. Most recently, I spent seven years at Ansys, the world's largest company dedicated to simulation. I had a variety of roles there helping companies deploy simulation-driven product development to decrease time to market and increase innovation. Back in May 2021, I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. David Robinson, the founder and CEO of Corvid. It was clear he was passionate about solving incredibly hard challenges across a variety of industries and physics domains with Corvid's in-house technologies. His passion and the opportunity to bring unique technologies to market was the reason I joined. Corvid has spent the last 18 years solving the most difficult problems in the DOD community to protect the American warfighter. With our headquarters being in North Carolina, we also have deep roots in the motorsports industry. As a company, we're nearing 300 employees and almost 150 million in yearly revenue. Our two primary software tools have their own full house, full-time in-house development teams. And lastly, something that's paramount to our strategy is our in-house supercomputer with 60,000 cores dedicated to high fidelity simulation for internal and external customers. Next. The title of this presentation includes high strain rate. So let's discuss how do I identify problems you may have that are high strain rate in the structural dynamics domain. First, you could look at how you're currently testing your products or materials. As we see across the top, we have a variety of testing methods. And as we go from left to right, things typically get more, uh, more expensive and harder to test or characterize. Across the bottom, as engineers, we see that more and more physics are present in the real world versions of these engineering problems. Other than this stuff being really cool and producing some jaw jumping animations, where is the values to model the toughest physics? As the physics get more challenging, typically the testing gets prohibitively expensive to do multiple iterations. Unfortunately, in these cases, the simulations also can become unmanageable in, in, in these areas. This is where we see customers retreat from virtual prototyping and go back to leaning on physical testing. It's not that there isn't value to reduce costly physical testing for high strain rate problems, but there's existing challenges with the traditional simulation workflows. The main reasons we hear from customers before they use Velodyne is that the total time to get trustworthy results vastly exceeds their available design timeline. No one wants to be the analyst who delivers results weeks after the prototype is already created, especially if you're finding if there's issues and the, the, the material's already been cut. It's our goal to help our customers to be able to virtually predict what they see, what they're going to see in validation testing early in the design cycle. Here, we're getting back to the spectrum of strain rate problems and noting the differences with modeling materials in each domain. As we go from left to right, the methods for defining the materials increases in complexity. Velodyne is able to handle all of this. One unique thing I'd like to point out is the need to correctly characterize the damage and failure 
occurring throughout the duration of these problems to properly understand what will happen in real life. Whether it's the car crash on the left with various bumper and underhood parts failing or the hypervelocity impact on the right where particles throughout the problem are drastically changing throughout the impact. As we look from left to right, we can see a variety of examples from a mix of application areas, all solved in Velodyne. Noting, in some of the cases towards the right, we can see the effort put into comparing simulation with physical testing to ensure Velodyne is delivering accurate results. Velodyne was created to predictively solve challenging problems without the need to iteratively tune models. Internally and externally, users of Velodyne are seeing a two to five X reduction in total time of simulation. We quantify that from going from CAD to having results we have confidence in. Over 18 years, Velodyne has matured into a stable workhorse for high strain rate physics and contact heavy simulations. Velodyne has much more potential to benefit commercial applications with accurate physics that have been validated over and over for DoD applications. These examples are niche to the DoD currently because that's really Corbett's background. However, each area has other commercial applications. As we see in, this, in the adv advanced contact example with a projectile impacting bar body armor to predict torso injury, injuries, it's a very complex problem. In addition to that specific case, we're working towards excelling areas like drop testing, drilling for oil and gas in surgical or human body modeling, and battery damage, just to name a few, in areas where impact and fracture mechanics are key to properly predicting what will happen. Moving to the right, for warhead and blast performance with energetics and high explosives. This has been a big part of our, our engineering services business at Corbid with the DOD, but we're also working with a couple of companies in the oil and gas space for modeling fracking charges and rig safety predictions from blast. So these are other areas where even though um, in the oil and gas industry, they're not necessarily trying to blow things up, being able to predict this type of phenomenon can be important to the engineering teams or to the safety teams in those respective industries. FSI, fluid structure interaction. interaction. In addition to the usual applications in aerospace, we're really excited to work in the areas of medical modeling around implantables. And we're also really excited to find new application areas that we haven't even thought of. Whether you're an aerospace and defense company doing work like we have on screen, an electronics company that needs to ensure you're design, designing an impact-proof product, a medical device manufacturer trying to meet FDA compliance and still get to market, or anyone else with problems previously too challenging to get a handle on, Velodyne can help engineer deliver truly trust, trustworthy results. This concludes the high-level introduction of Velodyne, and I'm really excited to introduce one of Corbett's technical leads, Greg Klaus. All right, thanks, Ryan. Uh, that was a really awesome introduction to Corbett and Velodyne. So Ryan's only been with us for about a year, and I already feel like he's a big part of the team. He's a lot of fun to work with. So I also want to take the time to thank CoreForum for hosting this webinar for us. Um, seems like we're going to have a good relationship. So my name is Greg Klaus, and I'm here to bring the technical perspective to the conversation. And I'm going to demonstrate how we use Qubit internally to build our high fidelity models. So I've been with Corbett since 2013, using Qubit and Velodyne as an analyst for missile defense applications, and as a technical lead since 2018, involved with business development, documentation, and training. I consider myself really lucky to have been a part of the continuous improvement of Velodyne over the years. And I'm excited to show off what it's capable of today. So as an analyst, I've only ever really used Velodyne. So I had to ask around the office to find out what sets it apart from some of the other solvers out there. And it was pretty unanimous. Our analysts all agree on three key differentiators. First and foremost is Velodyne's robust contact. So the phrase I kept hearing was, it just works. Um, within Velodyne, contact pairs are generated as needed in an iterative approach for solving forces within Velodyne's algorithms. Our contact solver is well suited for a diverse mesh density, as well as for high velocity impact mechanics. The second key point was reliable stability. 
So Velodyne has been built from the ground up for HPC and can handle over 100 million elements across hundreds of processors with complex dynamics, material failure, and for the analyst, <clears throat> no fear of the code crashing random. Unfortunately, we still haven't found a solution for user error, and I'm probably one of the biggest culprits of that one. Uh, last but not least is Velodyne's simplified inputs. A lot of analysts really appreciate the continuous improvement and development that we put into Velodyne to thoughtfully streamline our keywords and simplify our input formats to make it as intuitive and minimalistic as possible. So as Ryan mentioned, I put a ton of videos into these slides, but Velodyne is really so much more than just pretty pictures. So we have proven Velodyne's accuracy against test data in support of countless DOD efforts. These efforts have been aimed to protect our country both at home and overseas. And for the sake of national security, I can't show you guys any of those results, which is a real bummer, man, because these are some of the most exciting projects that we work on here in-house, and it has some of the most complex physics. Corbett's also been working with the DoD to validate and accredit Velodyne for their needs. Part of that effort includes a detailed basis of confidence document, which we refresh about every year or so. And it's something that I've been contributing out there too as well. One of the things that I can share with you, however, <laughs> is some of our predictive analysis that we've performed using our caveman human body model, which has been fully validated using cadaver test data in collaboration with major research universities and hospitals. Caveman and Velodon have been used to predictively assess injury risk for soldiers and even help football helmet designers reduce the risk of brain injuries on the field. So at Corvid, we work under the philosophy of quality in, get you quality out when it comes to our modeling practices. And Corvid has used Qubit almost exclusively since our company was founded to generate high fidelity hexahedral meshes. I think it's safe to say that just about every hex mesh built in house was generated using Qubit. It's become a really integral part of our tool chain. Over the years, we've benchmarked several commercial meshing tools, but Qubit's always been our workhorse. Because of this, we have decided that the best fit for our customer success moving forward is to continue our relationship with Qubit through Coreform to provide the best tool chain for Velodyne pre-processing. So when building a model, which is gonna be put through a whole multitude of scenarios, every detail counts. Sacrificing fidelity and quality can dilute the meaningfulness of the results. As parts fail, load paths can change along with the dynamics of the problem. We have time after time shown the benefits of high fidelity modeling practices within the results that we produce for our customers. There is a threshold to the amount of detail one can keep in an explicit model, as the time step is typically driven by the smallest elements in the problem. All features down to a millimeter resolution and sometimes finer if it deems it are retained within the mesh to provide the best gridded representation of a system that we can generate. Now that's not to say that you can't get a good answer without high detail, but we have found in our practices that where we put detail in, we get returns. The stability and efficiency of Velodyne makes these modeling practices viable. We've made high fidelity our standard by optimizing our tool chain within Qubit. Qubit is built within a customizable environment, which includes a Python API that lets you tap into and call integrated functions. Scripting complex and repetitive operations provides great returns in not only the quality of the mesh that we achieve with Qubit, but also the lead time to generate the model. Anyone who has meshed extensively knows that it's kind of an art form. Maybe you've even had dreams about meshing. Maybe they were nightmares. I've had plenty of both. The most successful meshers use every tool in their arsenal and know that less tedium is always better. This slide showcases a scripted function that we use internally, which merges web cut volumes while retaining the mesh before calling functions which help alleviate questionable elements. It helps keep our quality standards without the need for excessive iteration on cutting and meshing. So earlier, when I was talking about how we've optimized Qubit as an essential part of our tool chain, this is what I mean. So Corbett has developed a GUI plugin full of operations and checks that we use extensively day after day. 
This plugin leverages Python and PyQt to add a custom panel of buttons with context-dependent functions, which has improved our mesh generation lead time by roughly 30%. It's such an integral tool to our process that I absolutely refuse to mesh anything without it. I've meshed, <clears throat> excuse me, I've meshed so much over my career that I like to mesh apart in my mind before I even start cutting it up. The plugin we've developed has functions for cutting, imprinting, merging, uniting, repositioning, all with keyboard shortcuts. So when I'm doing a part, I can essentially mesh the entire thing without having to click through any of the GUI menus in the command panel. It helps me work through meshing apart without having to remember where the buttons are for these functions. We're currently working closely with Coreform to make this plugin available for distribution and sale to anybody on the line who is interested in adding this to their tool chain. And with that, I'm gonna kind of diverge here from the slides and I'm gonna show off three things on the live demo. So first I'm gonna go revisit that part from a few slides ago with some of the customizability in Cubic. And then I'm going to show a fully mesh model, which will go into Velodyne. And finally, I'm going to cut over to show post-processing results from that Velodyne run in our Corvid HPC virtual desktop environment. So here we go. All righty. So here's that troublesome looking part from earlier. As you can see, it's got nice curvature, um, not a whole lot of linearly sweepable surfaces, especially with these recessed bullet holes. But somehow we meshed it. So let me go ahead and show you guys a little x-ray view. So here it gives you an idea about kind of how we've made our web cuts to mesh this. And I'm going to go ahead and select it. And I can verify that there are 67 individually meshed volumes all merged and imprinted on one another to create this part. So when I visualize this mesh, anybody can, who's meshed can see that there's some sharp edges and some questionable geometry here for uh, getting good quality elements out. So let me check the mesh quality on this bad boy real quick. So here I'm looking at a scale Jacobian metric. Uh, typically, we like to keep things at 0.5 or above as a scale Jacobian is kind of like a metric as to show the, the skewness or like the, uh, the non-squareness, I think that's a word, I don't know, of an element. So the lower the number, the less square and uniform it is. So 0.09 is pretty rough and I wouldn't feel comfortable putting anything like that into my model. So what we have done is we've developed this script which will, as I explained in the slides earlier, unite and smooth all of the mesh within these volumes to give a better representation of the geometry within the element quality. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys the custom toolbar interface here included with Qubit. And so here I've got a tool that's gonna to check my quality for aspect ratio, a tool that's gonna to check my scale Jacobians. And then here's this merge and smooth script. And so what's nice is you could customize your tool chain however you want to with some of these integrated tools within Qubit. I can even add little icons if I wanted to. So here, I'll give it my dude. Okay, so when it's time to check the mesh quality, if I wanna to try to improve it using the script that we've generated, I'll go ahead and select all my parts and I'll click my function and it's gonna run through a whole gambit of calls. I'm not gonna do it on this, on this uh, demonstration though, since it can take several minutes and I don't wanna bore anybody. I don't like awkward silence. So I'll just go ahead and show the final result here in the screen part and I'll check the mesh quality. And as you can see on some of these rough edges here where we've got some of the 0.09 scale Jacobians, that has been smoothed out and rectified and a little bit more of a digestible quality standard. Alrighty, and then here, let me cut over to this. So this is a notional missile model. It's not representative of anything. You don't have to close your eyes. You're not looking at anything crazy. So 
one of our analysts had developed this from the ground up to be completely non-representative of anything out there. Something that we can actually show our customers, right? And so I just wanted to give everybody an idea of what a typical full scale system model looks like that we put into Belladon. So let me go ahead and highlight some of these parts and make sure I get my X-ray select first. There we go. It's more than I thought. All right, so I just wanted to verify that I've got 489 individually cut and meshed volumes to construct this entire missile that we meshed and that we are going to export and put into Velodyne. So here, I'll go ahead and show the mess quality. And I think we've taken this down to anywhere between five and one millimeter at any given place on the missile. And it's pretty uniform. It's a, it's a pretty mesh. And so one more thing that we can check before I cut over to the post-processing side is let's see how many elements are in this model. So it looks like we just got a hair over 2 million here for this missile which is pretty small for us. So with that, let me cut over to our Corvid HPC interface. And let me log into a virtual session where I can showcase some of our post-processing. All right, gorgeous. So here's that same missile that I just showed in Qubit already run through our Velodyne solver and we're rendering in visit for our post-processing. So here, I'll give you the basic anatomy of a missile that we're looking at here. So from here back, this is obviously the fuel tank and the rocket motor. Um, these fins are what we call control surfaces that controls the pitch and the attitude. Um, moving up a little bit further here, we have electronics and it looks like an IMU. And then here is our warhead section. And this is completely non-representative. I just want to remind everybody of that. Um, I've colorized the high explosive in yellow. And on the casing, you can see these little uh, toothed notches. And so this is going to be called uh, pre-scoring, which is going to kind of drive the fraction mechanics in a predictable way to get an engineered distribution of fragments, if you will. So as this thing explodes, this is gonna fracture in a, in a predetermined way to deliver an array of uh, shrapnel. And then up front in the missile, these are the eyes. So here we got some battery array, and then this would be um, some sort of a secret radar system for sensing and control. So in Velodyne, what's nice about this model is I didn't really have to do much outside of making the mesh. So within Qubit, I've built all the connectivity. I've, I've merged parts and had parts in, uh, you know, fit contact or face-to-face. -face. Um, Velodyne is gonna go ahead and automate all my contact pairs on its own, which saves a whole bunch of steps for me. So for this demo, I just wanted to blow up the, uh, the warhead in what we would call a static detonation case. So the only boundary condition I put into it was a detonation point at which to start my uh, chemical reaction in the high explosive. So let me just go ahead and step through time here to the next plot state. All right, well, it looks like it did what I wanted it to do. Then I can zoom in here and show you guys what's going on. So the high explosive has, um, an ignition and a growth model applied to it. So the elements will grow as the uh, ignition is triggered in each individual element to represent the high explosive. And as elements kind of deform and get into funky shapes, uh, they don't tend to be stable, right? So we convert those elements to a SPH particle or a solid particle hydrodynamics. And so that will continue the calculation in a stable manner without losing any of our energy, momentum, or mass. Contact is also automatically paired between SPH and solid Lagrangian domains. 
or the, uh, the hexahedral mesh, if you will. So here you can see I've got some of this high explosive is not yet converted to SPH. I've got my fragments appearing here. Let me just go ahead and hide my, my SPH cloud so you can kind of see how some of the fragmentation is taking form from the outer case. Okay, let me step to the next time state. So it looks like all of my energetic high explosive is converted to SPH and my fragments are beginning to form a nice radial distribution coming outwards from the explosion. And so here I'll render the SPH particles again, and these are colorized by velocity. Our scale is in, uh, CMS, sorry, it took me a minute, kind of brain squeeze there. Uh, so we're looking at roughly three kilometers per second here for this expansion rate on the high explosive cloud. So I've got a clip view. Let me go ahead and take off this clip view. And kind of show what this missile looks like in real time. So again, we've got our, our high explosive expansion and our fracturing uh, arrow shell and, and warhead fragments here. So I'll go ahead and step a little bit further in time and see how this propagates. One thing I feel is worth noting is you know, this is very, very big deformation strain rate type applications in a small time frame. So um, what I said just now is might have been a little bit redundant, but I think you get the image. And so Belladine stability in these early states can lead to a much better answer downstream. So when you get these fragmentations and these um, these phase changes and uh, different material characteristics in these, um, these highly dynamic moments, it gives the final answer, which we would really want, which would be our velocity vectors of our solid parts, uh, a little bit more accuracy. And so now with this data, I can take this and inform a multitude of post-processing softwares or analyses um, to you know, gauge whatever I want to with this thing. Weapons effectiveness, um, you know, you name it. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop myself there and cut back to our presentation. So thank you guys for listening to me drone on. I really enjoy using Velodyne and seeing what kind of insight can be gained when analyzing difficult engineering problems. Uh, it's the type of work that I'm actually passionate about as an engineer, and I'm fortunate to have landed this position. If anybody wants to explore if Velodyne can help them with their efforts, get in touch with us and we'll get you set up. You know, I'd love to help get your model up and running in our ecosystem. And with that, I'm going to kick it back to Ryan Bobrick. Great, great job, Greg. Thank you so much for the, the detailed slides and, and the great walkthrough of, of Qubit and Belladino. It was cool to see the results and look forward to, uh, to seeing what we could do there with some of the, the people on the phone, potentially. Our goal today was to clearly communicate how Coreform Qubit and Corvid Velodyne could be utilized to solve challenging problems in high strain rate regimes. However, HPC has come up a few times and we want to take a second to highlight some of our other offerings, such as our ITAR compliant HPC at five cents a core hour, our external aerodynamics design tool, Raven, and our vision VR package to, ver to visualize various simulation results in virtual reality. Our HPC ties in nicely with Velodyne as it enables us to provide turnkey access quickly and easily for either evaluation or production efforts without having to deal with installation, licensing, or maybe even your co company's IT. When it comes to licensing, 
We offer standard models like perpetual and lease that are very common in industry today. But we also offer a paper use model on our HPC, which can be great for customers who are bidding on specific projects and may or may not need licensing for various times or only need access a handful of times a year for complex or sophisticated problems. I know that uh, Matt um, had really commented that just don't need it often. So potentially the, the paper use model um, may be something that, that is interested. Our goal here on the licensing is really to make sure we're meeting our customers' needs. There's no ongoing subscription charges that say, hey, if you wanna log into HPC once a month, you gotta have this, this yearly subscription or we're gonna pay it charge per user. Just pay for what you need and pay for what you use. Next. We're looking to help engineers who have any challenge in the explicit dynamics high strain rate domain that could benefit from more engineering insight from Validine simulation. Even if you're not sure if your problem could be handled, we welcome the conversation and the opportunity to demonstrate Validine on your model. We're gonna transition back to Matt to moderate the q and I'd like to thank everyone for joining and contributing your time and attention. Ryan, great, thank you. That was exciting and inspiring. Thank you for uh, what you shared about, about Velodyne. Uh, we have quite a bit of time for Q&A now. You're welcome to stay on or when you drop off, there is a one question exit um, survey that you can just indicate if you'd like. Ryan or Greg or their team to reach out to you to discuss um, using Velodyne in your, for your problems in your workplace. Okay, so we've got some questions, some Q&A coming in. Uh, here's a question from Tim. Do you have documentation to support the guidelines for mesh quality? Have any mesh convergence studies been done to know how sensitive the results are to mesh quality? Greg, is that a question that you'd like to take? Greg Klaus or Greg Vernon? Let's see. You, either one. I would, I would say I would say probably Greg Klaus. <laughs> answer that. Pass the buck to the other Greg. <clears throat> this is a rather um, subjective question, in my opinion. Um, you know, we have done internal mesh resolution studies for certain applications. And, um, you know, we have a guideline that, that serves us well internally for a lot of our problems. But this, this all really comes down to uh, the type of answer that you're looking for and the type of problem that you're working on, right? So I would always say, you know, when it comes to quality, as far as like skew and aspect ratio and, and scale Jacobians and all that stuff, you know, you no matter what your application, you're gonna want a good quality mesh, you know, no matter what your software is really. Um, as far as uh, mesh resolutions are concerned, you know, that's that's all case dependent in my opinion. And, and Greg, I would I just wanna, oh, go ahead, Greg. Vernon. I was gonna say one more just thing in general, that this is not necessarily specific to Velodyne, but, what you do see, what I have at least seen more often with codes that are explicit versus codes that are implicit. With implicit codes, since there's there's not this really strict limitation on this explicit time step, it is a bit, you are able to get sometimes higher quality elements by refining elements below a, a given size to kind of allow for smoother transitions. Um, and so at least to one extent, you do have a limitation just with explicit codes in general that, that can restrict you from getting the mesh qualities that you might hope for or expect. Um, so, I mean, that's that's certainly not an issue really, um, limited to just Velodyne, but all explicit codes kind of, you know, kind of do have that. Um, just as a general, this is a general comment on that. Great. Thank you. And now I just got one note. Yeah. To, and, and just on, you know, as we looked at the, the strain rate slides from left to right, um, we've done some extensive benchmarking with Velodyne um, compared to some, some stuff that's out there. And I would say, 
you know, the amount of effort that Greg showed with some of those challenges is because the, the goal is to fully predict the end state, to fully model the, the damage and the phase change. For, for applications, you know, like let's say you just want to know if something breaks or not, we don't need to model fully like through the damage. So the, the extensiveness of going through the mesh is, is not necessarily as important because we're not necessarily looking to, to deform the elements as much. We're just looking to, to get to the point where, where the part breaks or there's some failure criteria that's met. So we can stop the simulation after that. Um, so we're seeing certain industries where, um, you know, they've really moved away from high quality hex meshing, like they may have five or 10 years ago because of computing limitations. And, and now they're just throwing a ton of tets at them because the, you know, there, there's a small team of analysts and they have plenty of licensing, but what they don't have is, is any more analysts. So, um, you know, in our benchmarking, you know, we've, we've been able to accurately predict the, the same failures that, that other codes have with uh, other, you know, non uh, hex meshes as well. Great, thanks Trey. Here's a question from Ibrahim. Could this system be used in nuclear reactors for large break loss of coolant accidents? I don't know if anyone on the on our panel has perspective that they could yield lend to that question. I'll let Greg take first stab. I am not well versed in, in nuclear applications. Um, so I would like to understand more about what goes into that type of problem. Um, Belladon does handle coupled structural and thermal solutions. And it also has the, um, the fluid structure interaction as well. So potentially, depending on how much physics and interaction is going on in that moment or what scenarios you're investigating, I'm sure we could take a stab at it. Cool. Yeah, Abraham, you can feel free to chime in with more, more questions now or we can reach out after the webinar on that. That's something we've talked about internally. And uh, the main questions there is just how much of the, the nuclear physics would, would you expect for Veladon to handle and how much, you know, do you either have an internal code or is there an industry standard code that you're, you're using to model that and potentially we're gonna either couple that code with Velodyne or, or just take answers and use it as an input um, into Velodyne. But if we're, if we're just purely talking about taking some amount of energy and predicting what type of damage that's gonna to do to let's say a, a wall that's of you know, a mix of materials and then understand um, where the coolant's going to go, we can definitely handle that problem. It's the, the front end and how we get to there that we would need to discuss. Great. Hopefully that and, helps make sense. Yeah, and Ibrahim saying it's the simulate the break of pipes. It's a thermal hydraulics only, no reactor physics. I will add to that question, if you don't mind. Um, we've got more than a few analysts in-house at Corbin who have come from the nuclear engineering background. So if there is a problem that you would like some consultation on, we could pull some of those subject matter experts in on it. No problem. Great, thanks. Um, so Greg, we would mentioned that uh, the uh, simplified inputs possible with Velodyne. Could you, is there a way that you could be more explicit about like wh what do you mean by simplified input? How does that compare to other codes? You're muted, Craig. You didn't miss much. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> so yeah, this slide here um, kind of showcases a, a really simple hypervelocity impact type of test. It's called a space plates. And so it's not a very complex setup just looking at it, but uh, from a numerical standpoint, you know, getting the right contact pairings and the right physics and, and everything into there, it's, it's a really good litmus test for, you know, how good your code can handle a hypervelocity impact type problem. Um, so on the left here, I've kind of got it separated between other codes and, and Velodyne on the right. And so on the left, these are the settings that somebody would have to input 
into um, you know whatever solar input deck they've been generating to get the right settings for this application. Whereas in Velodyne, we've kind of parsed things down a little bit. And so, you know, we don't have to tweak with our contact. We just turn on auto contact. Um, conversion to SBH is handled within the material definitions, as well as some of the external uh, shape functions of the elements. And the SBH solver is, is pretty easy to set up as well. So um, a lot less dials, if you will. Yeah, that was pretty powerful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, question from Zainab. Can one simulate seismic activities, for example, in rocks using Belladine? Seismic activities. So this would be on a pretty big scale, yeah. Um, that one I'm not 100% sure on how to answer. So, yeah. Maybe you could give some more specific I know with what you're asking there. Um, so we do have variable, very, uh, various different material models that we can use. And, um, you know, we can simulate a brittle material, uh, kind of like a, like a rock or um, concrete or something like that. Um, but when it comes to the time scales, I'm not really sure where that would fit in to either predict seismic activity or to model the response of a structure in a seismic event. Um, we could explore that a little bit more if you'd like to later on. With respect to the seismic activity question, I think where <clears throat> You know, if you were looking explicitly to model fracture or some of the things that would happen on a very small time scale, and then potentially we could implicitly solve uh, some of some of the other longer time step equations, just because solving, let's say, like a, an earthquake over seconds or minutes um, explicitly would be even with the HPC, that would still be very, very computationally expensive but i i definitely think if you're not getting the fidelity you're currently looking for in a specific area if we could better understand what what are you currently doing and what are the gaps and what's the desired application then um we could probably advise on at a minimum at least um some portion of that and if not i mean our technical team has an ex has experience with a, a ton of various codes and we can certainly help you with uh you know what is the the best shot in our best guess Great, thanks. Another question, what's the material database source? Do you have an internal or are you working with a partner for these data sets? So I'll give the first stab and then let Greg. So um, we do have a, a internal database that is user variable, but getting down into the, the specific data sets, um, it really depends on whether you're working on a specific contract because some of the, the materials shown are out of various uh, government codes or are ITAR. Um, the, the materials that were, you know, that are in our in-house database are, are need to be only shared over ITAR. So with what ships with kind of Velodyne off the shelf, um, you know, all the material models are there, but as far as like specific materials, like I'm gonna click through, there, there's a handful to get you started. Um, but depending on your application, we could certainly help you generate that. Um, and then in addition, um, you know, we, there's various sources that have, we could point you to, but unfortunately due to the redistributable rights, we're not allowed to just include right in our material database. So although it's, you know, freely available for us to point you in that direction and for you to go copy and paste it in the tool, we unfortunately can't just put it in the tool. Hopefully that helps the, uh, the question. Greg, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think I think that sounded pretty good. Um, the only thing I would add is we have, you know, roughly 50 or so mathematical and numerical models that you can populate uh, parameters into. And so <laughs> these can be used to, you know, characterize simple materials if you're doing just an elastic or a linear elastic plastic 
should probably be your easiest case, right? To very complicated uh, like temperature and rate dependent response or viscoelasticity, those type of models. Um, you know, we can handle all of that. So as far as where you would get that material information to populate those models, um, you know, typically that would be up to the user or or whatever program is being supported in that in that current state. Um, but like Ryan had said, you know, we've we've put together a pretty robust material database entirely for our uses, but we also service a lot of um, DoD type contracts, and so a lot of those materials need to be kept under veil and protected internally. So not all of that's readily available to share. Great, thank you. Here's a question uh, for your HPC. You mentioned that your core hours for processing is five cents. Does that include the cost of software that may be hosted there, or is that just the computation time? That's the computation time. Um, so for, for Velodyne and Raven, we have a, a cost structure that right now we're, we're in the very early stages. So we're just looking at, at one cent per core hour additional. And then if you're using other commercial codes, um, such as, you know, ANSYS, Abacus, LSTC, or, or any of those codes, we have customers who have um, those installs and we, we work to set up your licensing. So any commercial codes, it's going to be bring your own licensing. For, for Velodyne, um, you know, in the current state, we're looking at five cents a core hour for hardware and then an additional one cent a core hour for solving. However, that's uh, um, on our roadmap, that's definitely going to be tuned, you know, as we, we scale out in the commercial environment and move into 2023. So the, the goal now is, is really to advertise something that we think is very attractive and, and, and move from there. Okay. Um, well, Ryan, Matt, go ahead. I guess, Matt, I think there's one more question. It's probably, I, I know there's been some question or there's been one answer at least um, typed out, but I think it's good to bring up the question on using quadratic tetrahedral elements in Velod either in Velodyne or just in general. And I guess I'll preface with, you know, the obvious reason to use quadratic tetrahedral elements is to simplify the mesh pre-processing uh, more, so you don't have to do decomposition. Um, and I guess in general with, in my experience as an analyst, when we would look at tetrahedral elements for large deformation problems, one of the challenges with quadratic tetrahedral elements is that it's more, I mean, the automatic tet meshing routines tend to result in low quality tetrahedra um, and it can be it can be expensive to get quality tetrahedra, and then when you throw in mid side nodes under large deformation, they become almost more prone to inverting under lower deformations. And so it would seem to me that certainly in a problem space like Velodyne is used in, that it would seem to me that quadratic tetrahedra, you know, aren't preferable to linear hexahedra which can have higher element qualities to start with, but then are also more robust to deformation. Um, and you don't need to have higher order hexahedra like you do with tetrahedra elements for solid mechanics. But with that being said, I guess, um, Greg, it, it sounds like you said that you can handle tetrahedra in Velodyne. Right? And do you know if those are just linears or are those quadratics? I'd have to check with our development team. <laughs> But as far as as far as what I've used over the years, we would just simply use like a linear or a single point integration type solid element, mostly for the reasons that you just stated. And um, yeah, because I know it can be really it can be really challenging. Again, with with explicit, you have this critical time step, which is based on your smallest element. So a single element that's below a certain size, right? That's maybe ten times smaller than any other element. That single element can dictate the cost of your simulation. And, uh, um, and with, with these automatic tetrahedral mesh generators, we don't really have guarantees of like creating a no tet smaller than a certain size. I mean, we can do that, but that becomes really expensive. I know that's just one of the reasons why tetrahedras tend not to be preferable in the explicit regime. 
Yeah, mm. I think I think you explained it really well. Um, I, I don't know how to make that uh, more layman friendly, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, um, but yeah, yeah. I think I think that was a really good response. Um, if, if we'd like to talk about this a little bit more, you can always reach out to us, and um, we could have a more in-depth technical conversation offline. Good. We'll get in. That was Greg Verna. I had neglected to introduce him. He uh, is one of our um, experts at CoreForm, has a lot of experience with Qubit and a lot of other code. So thanks for that, Greg Vernon. And with that, Greg Klaus and Ryan Bobrick, thank you again for all the time you put into this webinar. It's been a pleasure for us at CoreForm to prepare this with you and get to know your, your team better. And um, we're just really impressed with with your expertise at, at uh, Corvid and, and your software as well. And, Hope this has been a valuable webinar um, for our audience. Again, as you leave, if you answer and indicate in the exit survey, then the Velodyne team will um, reach out to you to, to talk more about how they how they can help. So with that, everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.